All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Pandit Dasa. And you are, where are you today, Pandit? Well, I'm based out of New Jersey, so that's where I am today. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And Pandit uh, started uh, the Work Mindful Corporation, and he has quite an interesting background, which we're going to get into in a moment. But his whole work now is around bringing mindful leadership. So he's a mindful leadership and well-being expert and bringing this into the workplace. And he's worked with companies like, you know, Google and Citibank. And he's going to be talking at the Oracle conference. And he's been in the Wall Street Journal and done TEDx and everything. So quite a quite a background. But um, let's start off just a simple uh, question, Pandit. Um, so bringing mindfulness into the workplace, I mean, that sounds like a, a lovely idea, but what does it mean in, in real terms? So it can mean many things. So one thing is, is that uh, mindfulness is not just one thing, just like mm. having good health isn't just about eating right. It's also about sleeping. It's about properly having good relationships. So, you know, all of these things have many different aspects to it. So one aspect of bringing mindfulness into the workplace is sort of helping people become more self-aware of their own sort of unconscious biases that they may have, you know, with the diff maybe with different ethnicities or different genders or different races, just becoming aware that if I have certain unconscious biases, then I might not be listening to someone as carefully or I might dismiss another person's ideas uh, or just sort of ignore certain people but pay attention to other people. So just having that awareness then, and we all have biases. Mm -hmm. The moment we see another human being, immediately there's some triggers that go off in our mind, in our head, that makes us either feel comfortable with them or a little uncomfortable or just neutral and just sort of ignore. So that's part of being mindfulness uh, at work is to be aware of that. And also mindfulness at work means to be able to you know, understand and not let our ego get in the way, especially if we're in a leadership position. Because let's say as the leader, your manager, supervisor, you communicate an idea and there's resistance to it. So not mm -hmm. to let your ego get in the way, not to get inflamed by that, to be able to have the thoughtfulness and the calm to hear what the other person's saying, hear their objections, hear their point of view, why they're disagreeing, where they're coming from. Otherwise, ideas will never flow uh, in a consistent manner, there's always going to be our ego getting in the way, thinking that I've got all the answers, I'm the boss, everyone's got to listen to me. If that's the mood, there's not going to be a lot of exchange of ideas. So, so going back a moment to what you said about um, self-awareness, right? Because I've always, throughout my career, I've always found that to be the toughest thing, and it's not even people being or or us being so much self aware about other people. That is a part of it, like you said, but it's almost about being self aware about ourselves and and what our strengths and weaknesses are. It's very hard sometimes when somebody believes that they're really good at something, and you can see, or people from the outside can see that they're not, and it's very hard to uh, to. Um, have them come around to that point of view. So just going back to where you came from, you you were a um, a monk, right, for 17 years in New York City, which is an interesting place to be a monk, right? When you think about, you know, quiet, contemplative meditation, and you think about New York City, they seem diametrically opposed. But, but tell me a little bit about that and how you can help people to become more self-aware about their own, um, you know, perhaps where their strengths lie and where they don't. So first of all, I was a monk in New York City for about 15 years, actually. Nice. You gave me an extra two years, which oh, okay. I, I didn't have, but that's okay. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, so, you know, being self-aware, it really starts with being honest with oneself. It starts with having the desire to learn about oneself and to understand one's weaknesses. If one doesn't have an honest desire to learn about one's weaknesses, um, you know, then it's not really going to happen. We all know our strengths, or at least what we think our strengths are. Uh, but And we can see other people's strengths and weaknesses. But the thing our ego doesn't let us see is our own weakness. And that's the key thing. The only way to really have growth in one's personal life and even professional life and career and our ability to cooperate with one another, get along with one another, is to have that self-awareness. So if someone throughout our life has told us that we need to improve upon something, if a bunch of people have told us that and we're still ignoring it, telling ourselves, you know what, they can all go to hell, I'm successful, I've got a Mercedes Benz in the driveway, therefore everything is good. 
No, that means nothing actually, because a lot of people can have that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people can have a big house, and yet they can be having all kinds of personal, emotional issues, you know, de depression, all these kinds of things. So really, it starts with being self-aware uh, and that being honest that if someone does tell me something, I'm not going to react. I'm not going to fire back. I'm not going to immediately now find some something critical with them because the mind immediately shifts gear and says, oh, really? You think that you think I'm not good at this? Well, let me tell you where you're not good at, right? So that's how we immediately react and go on the offensive and the attack. Whereas if we can develop some humility, which is not a sign of weakness, it just means to be able to think of others more than you think of yourself. <laughs> you know, if we can have some humility, humility, and really take a moment to say like, you know, maybe there's some truth to what this person's saying. Maybe if it's not in that moment, but when you go home or a little bit, you know, in the moment it's hard, but later you're like, you know, I wonder if there's some truth to that. You know, someone else told me that six months ago and before that my parents told me that. Maybe there's some truth to it. And if we can acknowledge that, then and only then when the problem is diagnosed, can there actually be a solution and small steps taken to correct that or to improve that. So it is really difficult. And you know, even though I lived as a monk, I'm not gonna say that. And you know what, anytime someone tells me something, I'm like, yeah, of course, you're completely <laughs> right. You know, I don't react like that all the time. And you know, it does bother me, it does hurt, but I do go back and say, you know, I wonder what truth there is to that. And then I'll sometimes I'll even talk to someone else, actually, someone who is uh, a good friend, mm -hmm. who understands me, but who's not just going to side with me like, yeah, you know what? They can go to hell. They're crazy. They don't know what they're talking about. No, I unfortunately have some friends that can that can tell me, you know what? Actually, there is some truth to what they're saying. And I, can, I don't have a hard time hearing them because these are my friends. I know them. They're, you know, well-wishing friends. They'll be, and, they, and they all can say it in a nice way too, you know? So like, yeah, I, there is some truth to that. You know, sometimes you do, you are a little reactive to things. And maybe if you took a deep breath and didn't react in the moment, that could help you. So I think part of that is being humble and honest and maybe even having someone else to run it by just to see if there may be some accuracy to that. Yeah, it's it's interesting what you say about that um, when you start to see things over a period of time because I always feel like if 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 I'm always the common denominator in a particular situation, if you look at something and you look over time and you think, well, what is the common denominator here? And you think, well, actually, it's me. Therefore, maybe I need to start looking at myself first and rather than thinking, well, all of these other people have reacted in a particular way. Yeah. Um, this, this disparate bunch of people. Um, so I, so the idea of humility. So humility in corporate, in the corporate workplace. I was going to say corporate America, but it's really, I mean, corporate culture is, is yeah. very similar. And I've, I've, you know, worked and been exposed across the globe. So it's still relatively similar. So how do you, when you're working with companies, how do you advance the idea of humility in the workplace? Because it's not really um, something that's maybe championed a lot, because we really kind of admire the steadfast and the go-getters and the hard chargers and the people who keep charging even long after they should stop, maybe. Yeah. So again, as I mentioned earlier, humility is not a sign of weakness. It's not mm -hmm. a sign of a quitter, someone who's a pushover, right? Humility is, I think there's two aspects. There's one is being able to ask for help you know, in the workplace. A lot of times you think that if we ask for help, that's a sign of weakness, right? So that's a sign of humility is being able to ask for help. If you don't, if, if you're weak in certain aspects of work or, in, and we, we all are, we have some strengths and weaknesses. So make sure making, being able to ask others, our colleagues, you know, our supervisor, whoever it may be asking for help, you know, I can't figure this out. Can you help me out? That's a sign of humility, right? And also, Again, another sign of humility is being able to recognize our strengths and weaknesses. And not just our strengths, because we know we have a whole list of those, no problem. Mm -hmm. And and also at the same time, humility means to really to think of to put others before ourselves. So that you know, there was a nice I'm gonna paraphrase a quote from Nelson Mandela who said that uh, people will appreciate your leadership when if when there's victory you put others up front, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but when there's danger, you step up front. Right? So, you know, sharing that victory, putting others first, that's a sign of humility. So we're not insecure that, you know what, I'm the boss. I, I should get all the credit. So let me just make sure I'm up front and everyone else is behind me. Like, look, I'm the leader because I'm in front of everyone. No, the leader can be from leading from back. It's okay, putting everyone else, encouraging everyone else and giving everyone else the credit because ultimately people will realize, well, that's the leader. 
that person deserves the credit. They don't have to put themselves up front. So I think all of these are signs of humility. And so I encourage um, you know, folks to sort of uh, try to put the interest of others before their own and be confident and comfortable that if you do put the others of interest in, you know, ahead of your own, then it will all come back around. Helping people in the workplace is not a bad thing. It's good. It's going to foster greater teamwork, greater trust, and a positive and more happier work environment. Yeah, you you touched on something there um, because to have to be able to be you know humble and have humility and to be able to lead in the way that you're talking about, uh, right, where you give credit to others. Uh, it does require a level of confidence in your own abilities because you need to be you, you need to be that kind of person who's able to say, well, you know, I know what value I bring. I know what I've done here. Therefore, I don't need my face up on the poster. Like you know, the team can go up there. I'm fine. Um, but a lot of people fundamentally lack confidence, and all of these other problems come from layering on on top of that lack of, of fundamental confidence. So how do you start, I mean, maybe through mindfulness or whatever, how do you start to build a better sense of of confidence? Well, really, again, I think uh, with, with mindfulness can really help us boost our self-confidence because I think one thing that um, we don't do is we don't take enough time to self-reflect. Mm-hmm and appreciate all the amazing things that are happening in our life in the moment and all the wonderful things that we've accomplished in our life. The problem is we're always comparing ourselves to others and that kind of shoots our confidence because we sometimes make unrealistic comparisons to someone else who may have you know, gotten to a certain level in the company sooner than we did. Well, that's okay. Maybe there's other aspects of our life that we're successful in. Maybe in our personal life, maybe we've got a ton of friends. Maybe the other person, they're maybe at the top, but maybe lonely at the top. So I think what we do is we make unrealistic comparisons with others, and it prevents us from seeing what we've achieved and what we've accomplished in our health, in our well-being, in our relationships, in our career, and just sort of learning to you know, have that awareness and taking time out to be grateful for what we have, that will get us out of that negative mindset that, oh, I didn't achieve enough, or I'm, you know, I, I can't do it. You know, who says we can't do it, right? Who says we're telling ourselves we can't do it? If someone else has said it, said it, why do we have to necessarily believe that? Why not do the best that we can and you know and try to improve upon that and not worry about what everyone else is accomplishing? Because everyone else is different, you know? If a fish you know, uh, compares itself to a monkey in its ability to climb a tree, it's going to be in, in depression. <laughs> so not saying that we're fish, but like, let's not, unless, I, I think it doesn't really, you know, you can be inspired by others sure. who are more successful, inspired by them, learn from some of the positive things and learn what not to do because everyone makes, you know, mistakes and does things. But when we compare ourselves mm-hmm. to such a degree that we end up depressing ourselves I think that's unhealthy and that shoots our own self-confidence. So I think we have to take time out to be realistic with our own skill set, with our own capacity, with our own talents. So we have to be realistic. So, yeah, and and I think that's a I, I love I love that point about um, you know self reflection and actually looking at what are the things that I have achieved in in my life or you've achieved in your life in isolation from everything else. Just that, and I think it's unfortunate we live in an era um, while social media does a lot of good things. One of the downsides of it is people see snapshots, you know, taken frozen in time of people, and they look at them and they tend to fill in all the gaps around it and go oh look pandit's life is so much better than mine look at him i looked on instagram today and he's in new jersey and he has this wonderful life and my life sucks you know and i and we get and we get sucked into that so i really like that idea of self-reflection and sort of isolating out the world and looking at you know what have i achieved in my life and what do i want to achieve yeah and i think it really means a nice deep look because you know whenever i feel like I should have achieved more success and this honestly whenever I feel that mm-hmm. and then I look at honestly what what has I have achieved um, and I'm like wow this is much more than I'd actually expected to be where I was mm-hmm. supposed to be and for some of us maybe that's not the case maybe you expect it to be in a different position but if you can still be satisfied and grateful for where you're at and what you have 
you'll notice you can shift your mood immediately. So like, you know, and this is something I think salespeople can struggle with a lot because mm-hmm. you don't achieve your goals. You find yourself in depression. You look at all the people who have achieved their goals. Now you've got some kind of a, a complex about yourself. I'm not good enough. I couldn't do it. And all of that, the only thing that's accomplishing is it's leading you into a depressed state of mind. It's not accomplishing anything good. Mm-hmm. Really in that. As long as you know you did the very best that you could, then that's all you can really do. You can ask yourself in a healthy way, what can I do to achieve my goals in the next month or the next quarter? And then take steps to move in that direction. And if it doesn't happen, then you just can't beat yourself up because that accomplishes nothing. It lowers your morale. It, it, you look depressed. You feel depressed. When you go into the office, people know that. And now their, their image of you is even decreasing further because of the way you kind of beat yourself up. So if, if we can be confident in who we are, in our abilities, and recognize these are my abilities. You know, Maybe I'm not as good of a talker as someone else, but maybe I'm kinder than someone else. And maybe that's what's going to sell. And if not... That's okay. You are what we are, you know, and we can improve. We should always strive to improve, but not compare ourselves to others who've achieved success or met their goals in a way that's going to actually discourage us and depress us and and demotivate us. Yeah, well, precisely because obviously you actualize what you visualize and that. So, I mean, if you're starting to to do that, you're going to go down that, uh, unfortunately, as you say, it's going to get, it's going to compound itself, right? Um, so um, let me just go back for a moment to when you were, when you were a monk in, in New York City, right? What were some of the surprising lessons you learned that you've been able to take now and bring into your work with corporations and leaders and salespeople and all that? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, monkhood. <laughs> <laughs> in some ways be uh, similar to to corporate life in some de- to some degree mm-hmm. uh, you know because as a monk uh, you're living with other people you know a lot of th- we have an impression of monks first of all that I want to just clarify <laughs> you know we learn about life of a monk from hollywood movies which is not very accurate obviously i mean it's the part that they're living in the mountains or the woods you know and all just meditating all day long or chopping wood or whatever people may think the lighting incense okay so you know, some of that may be true, but I was living as a monk in New York City. So that's why my book is called The Urban Monk. You know, it's like <laughs> Urban Monk. So uh, I was living in an environment. We're living in a Manhattan apartment with like, you know, 15 people, like a three-bedroom apartment. So it was a tight, you know, so you you had to share things. You had to – one of the biggest things was learning for me as a monk was learning to recognize and appreciate other people's skill set. You know, and other people's talents and what they bring to the table. Because, you know, there's certain things we're really great at. And when we're really great at something, we compare that to someone else who has a very different skill set. Like, for example, someone may be really creative, really artistic, and do amazing artistic work. Then there's another person who's just a go getter and doer. They can do everything on time and everything is perfectly done, all the you know, I's are dotted, T's are crossed, but the person who's art, really, really artistic, they may not pay attention to that, but they're like, they put together something beautiful, and now the person who gets it done is thinking, oh, well, you know, like, this person's never on time or can't get things done, and this other person's thinking, well, this person's not sensitive at all, can't appreciate hmm. what they have. So one thing that I learned, um, which I continue to learn, of course, is being able to see where other people are at and what their talents are, what their skill set is, and not thinking that they're any less than me because they're not as good as something as I am. Because eventually I started to realize in my time as a monk that when I really genuinely looked at other people's talents and qualities, I'm like, you know, I can't do that half as good as what this person just did. And that person there, I can't do anything with of what they do. And I was like, whoa. I never, because we never really take the time out to do that because we think that, you know, we figured it out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> God's gift to this planet, you know? So if we have that mentality, then we're never going to grow. But when I started to do that, I just had a lot of aha moments because I started to see, wow, these people are so talented and so dedicated and so committed in their own way. And I don't know if I could be committed in that particular way. I'm committed in a different way. So this was one really big lesson when you live together with someone and you only see through your lenses and the way you want 
to see everything. And the way, and if you only want people to be the way you want them to be, that's a real success, a formula for disaster and a real formula for just sort of a frustrating relationships because everyone's got those lenses. Everybody wants the other to be like them. But let's just appreciate people for who they're at and who they are and where they're at and what they can do. So this was, I think, one of the biggest lessons. Yeah, and I think that reinforces the idea. And I think this is one of the most fundamental ideas, I think, is that whether you believe in the law of abundance or whether you believe in the law of things being finite, right? And I think that's often what comes into play is that people think, oh, well, if somebody else is good at that or they're getting praise or there's something there's somehow it's subtracting from the pie and I should be getting a bit of that pie instead of saying there's enough for all of us and and all ships rise, right? If you have um talented people and you have talented people in different things, then you know, that's a recipe for growth. Yeah, definitely, you know. And one of the other um things that I really kinda imbibed or trying to imbibe is to really recognize that there is enough for everybody <clears throat> and what's meant to be mine i will get mm -hmm. and what's not meant to be mine i won't get no matter what i do no matter how hard i try if it's really not meant to be mine if i'm not meant to have that thing or position or title whatever it may be it's just not going to happen no matter i beat my head up against the wall it's not going to happen so i've sort of learned to you know, work hard and pursue things to the fullest degree. But at one moment, when I know it's not happening, then back off, take a deep breath and relax and save myself a lot of stress and anxiety and frustration. So I think that is maybe a little more philosophical. Maybe that sounds like karma. You know, you're going to get what's meant to come to you. Uh, and I really am a firm believer in that. And I, and I feel like it just helps me go through the day like, you know, sometimes if you're in sales and, you know, you've done everything possible, you've made your thousand cold calls, you've reached out to all the people that you know, told you to call them back, you've reached out to whoever you can, you know, hot leads, cold leads, everything, and you still didn't meet your goal. At that moment, instead of, you know, like, you know, punching the wall or something, you know, uh, or throwing your computer off the table, <laughs> take a deep breath and say, you know what, I honestly did everything I could. Yeah. Now I'm going to let it go and wait for the new month and because if you're frustrated and angry in that moment and it's okay for a little bit of that to be there it's normal and human but how do we what what things do we break afterwards is yes. that we inventory <laughs> but if we're angry and frustrated in that moment and we remain like that then we're only causing more damage to ourselves we're causing ourselves a headache we're giving ourselves stress lowering our health and possibly going to uh, speak negatively to a friend or a colleague as a result of that. So all that can be avoided because the goal's not met. So none of that's changing. The goal's still not met. But our mindset and our mood can be adjusted to so the rest of the day and the week is in ruin or the weekend is in ruin because I'm just thinking about that. So this is where mindfulness can really come in handy is that to recognize, okay, now I put the brakes on, put the car in park and move on and take the, the next trip starts on Monday and we're going to start a whole new trip. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think that's a great uh, a great place to conclude today because that's a great piece of advice. Is like if you feel if you've done everything, if you've given it your best shot and it didn't work, that's okay. Take a deep breath and go. Okay, start again Monday. But I gave it my best shot. I didn't get the reward this week, but maybe next week I will. Exactly. You know, that's the that's the only way to move throughout life in almost everything. You may be chasing a relationship that doesn't work, or you may be chasing a position or wanting to get a certain car or house if it doesn't happen what are you going to do keep beating yourself up mm -hmm. take a deep breath and look at the opportunities that are coming we don't want to miss out on the things that are coming our way because we were looking past them to other things and missing out on what's coming our way yeah no fantastic uh, uh, fantastic pandit so before we go can you just tell the viewers a little bit more about yourself how they can learn more about you yeah so the best way to if you want to get in touch with me uh, there's two ways you can go to my website, which is panditdasa.com, P-A-N-D-I-T-D-A-S-A, panditdasa.com. And you can also find me on LinkedIn and because I post a lot of things on LinkedIn, the places that I'm speaking at, the workshops that I'm doing and the lectures that I'm doing. So LinkedIn and my website, you can just Google me. You'll find me there. My videos are also there if you Google me. So just find me, get in touch with me, and I look forward to having a lot more conversations like this. Great. Listen, thanks, Pandit. Again, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon.
So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.